You can try anything. You can change jobs every two to three years and change branches and change where you live. You can go overseas and live. You can, there's nothing else that gives you the opportunities that being in the Army has. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was in the U.S. Army from 1977 through 2013 when I retired. I retired as a major general. I was born in Grove City, Pennsylvania, but that's where the hospital was. I was actually from Stoneboro, Pennsylvania, a very small town, population about 850, and that's where I grew up. I have an older brother, an older sister, and most of my cousins were at least 15 years older than me. My dad drove a train for New York Central. He was an engineer. And when I was a kid, he had a whistle that was just for me to let me know he was coming home. So I always knew where my dad was. My mom and her brothers and sisters ran a grocery store, a general store at that time. And in this little town, there were a lot of Amish people who lived on farms and would come in on Saturdays with the horse and buggy to shop there. So it was a very different time, I think, to grow up because in this little town, it's almost like time forgot in some ways. So I, would, I used to think that I was growing up in the 1930s and 40s with some of the ways in which things were done, the way the school was, where you had teachers in school who taught not only your siblings, but your parents. I chose Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, Edinburgh then State College, now Edinburgh University. I studied English. I also was a photographer with the sports department, the editor of the yearbook, I didn't want to teach. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do with it, with a degree. I finished in 1975, stayed another year, had a master's degree, and then I had friends who were joining the Army. Uh, very difficult time right at the end of Vietnam, but they were enjoying the challenges, they were traveling, they were having new experiences, and I thought I could do that as a way to get started in life, as a way to launch. I did not go through ROTC. At that time, the pro there was a program called direct commissioning. It still exists or exists in new forms today for some specialties like cyber. But at that time, this was a direct commissioning program into the Women's Army Corps. The Women's Army Corps was started in 1942 as the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. In 1943, it became the Women's Army Corps, which was at that time meant to provide women to serve in the Army during World War II, emergency service only to be terminated at the end of the war. However, because of everything they did, not just in the Army, but in the other services, at the end of the war in 1948, President Truman made women's service permanent for all of the armed forces. It was very competitive. So there were about 110 slots per class in the WAC officer basic course and there were probably five times as many applicants for each slot in that course. So it was a very high caliber of people selected. Um, it was very difficult to get in. And I was in the next to the last class of WAC officers selected. So one day you, you know nothing and the next day you were touched by the magic wand and you're a lieutenant. Fort McClellan, Alabama was probably the hottest place I had ever seen at that time where, or it would rain and steam up from the streets. So that was, that was an experience for me. At first, I thought some of it was ridiculous. Certainly, they tried to explain to me that staff, office, staff offices in a battalion and brigade, and they made no sense to me. So I learned very quickly I needed to just learn and not question certain things because this is how we do it here. And so once I learned it and understood it, it did make sense to me. My branch at that time was the Women's Army Corps but you were detailed into another branch to serve. It wasn't until the WAC Corps was disestablished in 1978 that women were actually assigned branches. So the branch I was given was Signal Corps. I had wanted to work in public affairs for the Army. I didn't know it was not an entry-level specialty. So I was given Signal Corps. Perhaps that could have been broadcasting, but my actual specialty was telecommunications. I was assigned for my first duty station back at Fort McClellan. So I worked in the military police school and I did instructional training development. And then I branch transferred into the military police corps. I was sent from Fort McClellan a year or so later after the advanced course to Fort Meade, Maryland, where I served as a platoon leader in the 519th Military Police Battalion. 
which was attached to the 82nd, was a operational quick deploying unit. I also got to do some law enforcement garrison police work, and I enjoyed that very much. I learned quite a bit from that, from being more in that part of the real army than being in a schoolhouse. After that was when I left active duty, and for a couple of years I was in the IRR. I spent some time in Germany working there as a civilian, and then I decided to come back to the States. I got a job working for the Army at Fort Lee, Virginia, and managed to worm my way into the public affairs career field, first through the reserves, and then working in it as a civilian. So I could double my experience and my knowledge and hopefully learn much more, much more quickly. While I was with the 80th Training Division in Richmond, Virginia, I spent a number of years there, but the 80th Division had a policy where they would do what they called it was a, a like a PCS. So you wouldn't stay in one job for too long. So every two to three years, they would rotate officers into different jobs. So I got to do public affairs as a captain. I got to command a company as a captain. I commanded two battalions. And then I'd go back to public affairs. So I had the opportunity to go back and forth. I enjoyed battalion command. I enjoyed brigade command more than battalion command. In battalion command, I had too many bosses. And in brigade command, I could actually work to make a difference, I thought. And Army Public Affairs exists, has since 1922, to inform the American people about what the Army is doing, what their Army is doing, what your taxpayer dollars are doing, what your people are doing. So I, I liked all of the parts of different types of public affairs, planning, execution of missions, um, I got to have some great experiences in going to different exercises. I got to be an observer controller in various places. And after some time in this, I got a new civilian job and I moved to Germany to work at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. Now by that time I had been teaching media relations at not just the quartermaster school but at the logistics management college at Fort Lee. So once in Germany, I continued to teach, but now to international audiences. So I taught media relations to our foreign area officers. I also taught the international students. I got to run conferences in Croatia, in Moscow, in Hungary. I taught at the NATO school, and I taught at Sweden's International Training Command for 11 years. My goal was to become a colonel. I knew I could, I knew I could get to lieutenant colonel. I wasn't too sure about the colonel part. So while I was still in Germany, I applied for the Army War College. I knew that was a step I needed to have. And I was not selected the first time or the second time or the third time because I had applied to go in residence. Once I applied to do it by distance learning, I was accepted. Yeah. So then it's the two-year program, not just the box of books, yeah. but it, by that time it was also online as well. So I did some of that. Then there is 9-11. Um, I am now promoted to colonel and recalled. So I spent the next six months on active duty at the U.S. European Command. So my reserve duty was with UCOM in public affairs, and they ran out of money and told us all to go home. <laughs> so by then, the Marshall Center had backfilled my position. And so I came back to the States, and I took a civilian job with TSA, which was brand new then in 2000 two to four, and then I had brigade command in the reserves, which was a training unit, but not either military police or public affairs specific. What is, what is the role of public affairs on the battlefield? It's several things. First of all, it's communicating with soldiers in, inside of the units that are deployed. These are things you need to know. Here's what you need to understand about the mission. Here's where we're going next. It's also talking to the local populace, some of this outreach and then there is talking to the families and the troops back home and to civilian audiences back home. So it's all three things. Now, when I left Brigade Command, I was also working at DOD. I was with the Reserve Forces Policy Board. So I got to see policy being made up here. And then at my other job, I could see how it trickled down and came out at the other end, if it ever did, <laughs> which was very interesting and, and also instructional as to how you inform policy so it actually does make a difference to the soldier on the ground. 
So I got to spend some time with some high-level people there and learn quite a bit from them. I was selected for Brigadier General at that time. I didn't expect that. I did not expect that. I was not anticipating it. Um, Many people were shocked, and I was one of them, I think. I had been a colonel at that time for about a year. I was selected to be the Deputy Chief of Public Affairs as an IMA, or Individual Mobilization Augmentee, to backfill there. So that was my next assignment. I spent three years in Army Public Affairs. I'd spent some time doing different taskings that had me travel to different places in the Middle East. I'd been back to Germany. I still taught. I got to manage the career field, if you will, and apply all of those years of preparation in hopefully improving things in schools for our younger people coming in. Some of the big discussions we had at Army Public Affairs then were about things that tradition, we have a magazine, we have to keep the magazine. No, it needs to be online. Soldiers Magazine, we have to we have to have a website. We have to make sure the website communicates to all of our audiences and we say the same thing to all of our audiences. We don't differentiate. I enjoyed that job very much. From there I became the Deputy Chief of the Army Reserve. So I was the number two director in a command of 205,000 people. I was given my own command after that. And so my last tour in the Army was to stand up a brand new unit in Salt Lake, Utah from the ground up. The day I took command, there were two people in the unit, me and the Sergeant Major. And from there, we grew it over the next two years to have 23 separate subordinate commands. I had the legal command, which was 1,785 attorneys all of the information operations units, so the high-tech specialties. Uh, We also had a homeland defense piece, and we also had all of the joint pieces, all of the people who are individuals under detachments with the unified and specified commands. So I had people at Transcom, Northcom, UCOM, PACOM, all of them. And there's several ways, I think, to look at cyber communications and our evolution to what is now Cyber Command and the cyber elements within each of the armed services. And some of that was very controversial when I still had, I had two information operations units and a cyber unit. And I had some parts of them that did cyber, some parts that did info ops, which is not public affairs, it it is information campaigns designed to influence. And when we talk about public affairs, we say we do not influence, we inform. But I.O. missions are meant to influence, influence attitudes, beliefs, actions. Now, they have taken me into this training room where they look for break-ins into the system. You know, here's, here's how we find a hacker. And I couldn't have done that. It was really difficult to understand how the work proceeds. And this type of training has to be done in a closed system. You can't do it on an open network that is active. So it was interesting to see how it works. Many of the people who work in that field in the reserves do similar work as civilians. So they are very highly trained and experienced, whether they work for uh, cyber companies independently or they do some combination of cyber and intelligence work. So part of my job was to understand it well enough to be able to promote and support and protect interests with equity as to these decisions being made as to where this would be placed. Who was going to own cyber was a big question for several years. Cyber Command is at Fort Gordon, Georgia. This doesn't mean it is owned by the Signal Command or that it is owned by intelligence. There are elements of both. And there was also an element about artillery because it involves targeting. It's a very different type of targeting, but if we're talking about rice bowls and keeping keeping one's organization alive, there was some of that. I never set out to to do this. I never set out to write this kind of a book. When I retired, I wanted to write fiction. I wanted to write thriller fiction. But there's something to be said for spending 30 some years for in writing in a military style or even in a journalistic style. And to write fiction is entirely different. So I made a commitment to do this. I will learn how to do this and I will get good at it I don't think I knew how long it would take me and or how difficult it was going to be. But I worked at it and I had written 
three, four, five books that are still on a shelf. And I'm still thinking about them when in 2017 I was asked to speak at AUSA as a substitute. This was the Army Women's Foundation. We want you to talk about leadership. And I had just found an obituary of Stephanie Check Rader, who had been a counterintelligence agent in World War II. She had just passed away, and there was a major movement to get to the Legion of Merit for her. She had retired, left without ever receiving any kind of an award. So as I learned her story and talked about her, I thought, well, this is really fascinating. I kept it, put it away, and then I kept finding more. As the greatest generation passes from this earth in ever greater numbers, I kept finding their stories. And in some of them, I would find errors, and I would, mm, I'd want to correct them. But some of them, I would be surprised, why don't I know this? You know, 30-some years in the Army, why don't I know that there was an all-African-American, all-female unit that was the only woman unit deployed during the war, and that they went to Birmingham, England, to fix the problem with the mail? I never heard that. I never knew that. Why don't I? So I kept collecting these stories, but I wasn't clear on what I would do with them until about 2019 in October, and I thought, I need to put these together in some form or fashion. So I have an agent. The agent talked to publishers, and by the end of January 2020, I had a contract. The contract specified the book would be turned in by 1 May. So that left me February and March and April to write it. I had written nothing by that point. So I think that's where the learning curve got very steep and moved very quickly because yeah. I had to do it. But it also was a problem because of the pandemic. So now I can't go to the Holocaust Museum or the National Archives or the Library of Congress. No one is answering me because they're not there. So I started buying books online, which was fortuitous because it made me go back and read original writings from that period. And many of the people I wrote about had written autobiographies in 1946, 1947. So I have a whole collection now of books with, still has the card in the front where it was last signed out of some high school library in 1960. But that was, that was the basis for writing the book was to, to tell the stories, to share them further, to have the opportunity to build an understanding of what they did to create the modern opportunities today. And also I think to honor them and, and their families. Charity Adams is certainly one of my favorites, the commander of the 6888 Postal Battalion. And I did read her autobiography, published in 1948. And I was also fortunate enough to be able to talk with the advocates for her who have worked so hard on not only a, a unit award for them, but also a memorial that is set up now at Fort Leavenworth, and now the Congressional Gold Medal is being awarded to that unit as well. So I've gotten to meet some of their family members. I've gotten to meet uh, Charity Adams Early's son, and hear some more of their stories. But I was so impressed with her because of how she prepared herself for every challenge and how she had the most upright sense of not only duty, but of what was right and wrong, and she never backed down. She never compromised. She never gave in. She always did what was right, and you could absolutely count on her for that. When you look back over your career in the military, what, what, what do you reflect on? What has it meant to you? More than anything, it has meant to me opportunity, because there's no other organization in which there is a true meritocracy like this in which you can try anything. You can change jobs every two to three years and change branches and change where you live. You can go overseas and live. You can, there's nothing else that gives you the opportunities that being in the Army has. So from working in public affairs and even into the reserves, I also got to do messaging with recruiting. Now recruiting has been kept separate from public affairs. It's how it was set up in the regulations in the 1920s but being able to see how this works and how it is structured and how it is meant to bring young people into the service. I think the messaging that you do in public affairs and recruiting is very similar in some ways. One of the things I like to see in recruiting is there's something here for everyone. There's a definite culture that is open to everyone's capabilities, their 
diversity and what they bring to the fight, what can you do to help make a difference? And I think the Army is very open to this. Now, many of my friends from high school or college would be, ooh, what are you doing in the Army? Or they, they only understand it from having seen a lot of really bad movies. And they try to make comparisons and they just can't quite do it. So it's like, no, why don't you come with me? Come with me and let me show you. One of the things that I have enjoyed the most about being in the Army is not only the opportunities for myself, but being able to share those with others, opening doors with those for those who worked for me or who I was around and being able to see and perceive what they needed, what they could do, how it took a helping hand to get them somewhere along that way and being able to do that. That was the best part. One of the things that I miss is the camaraderie, which I think everybody must say this because it's true. And I even missed it watching the Top Gun movie, which kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. But I think the more that we can share what it means to be part of that team and to enjoy a team's successes, the more we'll be able to keep what we have in this all-volunteer force and see it continue to be successful.